Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our ongoing expose on Gradus ad Parnassum by Johann Fuchs. That Latin treatise, published in 1725, is public domain in our day, copyright free. Our next example of two-part first species counterpoint from the Gradus moves the final of the Cantus firmas to the note F, popularly referred to as Lydian mode. Observe the new location of the semitones between scale degrees 4 and 5 and 7 and 8. Let's examine this Lydian scale, ascending and descending. One of three major modes, the Lydian sound is distinguished by its raised fourth scale degree, making it even more major than the ordinary major scale. Let's listen. Bear in mind that the fourth degree of Lydian mode allows for an optional musica ficta. That's the accidental above the note B. When applied, the musica ficta effectively converts Lydian into an ordinary major scale. You will often hear that subtle change in the descending direction. Next, let's have a listen to a cantus firmus in the mode that we today might call Lydian. Interestingly, in Gradus ad Parnassum, the cantus firmus, starting on the note F, completely avoids using the fourth scale degree, and the author does not employ the word Lydian either. If you are wondering which C clef we are using there, that is a tenor clef sign. You should know all clef signs. That includes the tenor, in which the note middle C is the fourth line of the staff. The note F, a fifth below middle C, is the starting note and final of our Lydian mode. The letter names of the notes are here labeled. Practice singing the letter names along with the recording. Ready? Lydian is a major mode, therefore, movable solfege singers should sing with the note F as the do, the tonic pitch. Try singing along with the recording in solfege as shown here. Ready? For the upper counterpoint, we use the next higher clef, alto. Associating nearby clefs together also makes it easier to see the distinction between simple and compound intervals, that is, the octave plus intervals. You'll notice that the rules for harmonic intervals still apply. Reading off the list, vertical intervals between the two parts must be consonant, and a perfect fourth is forbidden as a dissonance. Harmonic intervals should be mostly of the imperfect type, and perfect unisons are not permitted at all in the middle. Similar and parallel motion going into a perfect interval are not allowed, but contrary and oblique motion are usually okay. An upper counterpoint must cadence on a perfect octave at the end, preceded by a major sixth. In minor modes, the seventh scale degree may be raised a chromatic semitone. Repeated tones are not allowed in the cantus firmus, but a single repeating note is allowed in the counterpoint. Rules for melodic intervals regarding length, voice range, and span, permitted and forbidden intervals, still apply as well. Note. Compound, chromatic, augmented, diminished, and any seventh intervals are not allowed in either upper or lower counterpoint. 
As we have already seen, the upper counterpoint solution found in the gradus looks like this. But do you see or hear any breaking of the rules just reviewed? For practice, you should also decode the solfege of both parts and sing them with a fellow student. Now on to the lower counterpoint. When the counterpoint is the upper voice, it may begin at either the perfect fifth or perfect octave above the cantus firmus. Not so when the cantus firmus is the top voice. A lower counterpoint may only begin at the perfect octave below. Neither diminished fifth nor perfect fifth below are allowed, for reasons discussed earlier. Moving directly into a perfect fifth or perfect octave is also not permitted. Voice independence requirement. And at the final bar, the two parts merge into a perfect unison, not an octave. The Lydian cantus firmus is the tenor voice, now on top, and we add a lower counterpoint in the bass clef staff below. In these exercises, we again write neighboring voices with adjacent clefs. You are welcome to transcribe the top part to a treble or bass clef staff if you wish. Now this is interesting. In bar five of the lower counterpoint, there is a B flat. Can you think of any reasons for this added accidental? If you can, post your response in a comment. See also the link in the description to a video called uh, Creating a Balanced Line. But the main attraction is bars four to seven, where the lower counterpoint does not remain lower, but rather crosses above the cantus firmus. Listen. The tenor remains within its range, but why do you think it is at times allowed to dip below the bass? Don't let this confuse you. According to the gradus, better voice leading. Otherwise, there would be way too much parallel and similar motion. Alfred Mann adds a footnote to the effect that, in a three and four part writing, voice crossing is a valuable addition to a composer's tool chest, so we'll leave it at that for now. See the description. Look again at those figures written above the lower counterpoint line. They represent the vertical interval between the two parts. So for the bars of voice crossing, bars four to seven, the tenor part becomes the real bass voice. The figures measure the interval up from whichever voice happens to be the lower of each bar. Now, wasn't all that exhilarating? Beyond transcribing the upper and lower counterpoint exercises from the gradus, which you ought to copy into your personal notebook, you should try playing them through in pairs on your piano keyboard, or perhaps singing one part while playing the other. You are also invited to compose and play new and independent counterpoint lines, upper and lower, with the same Lydian cantus firmus in the middle. Do not play all three parts simultaneously. Thank you for watching our videos and liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing, and dinging the bell.